Turn the lights up on the screen. It all was like a wash up screen. All right, we all recording. What's that? Okay, recording. Cool. All right, then we get started here. I appreciate everybody coming out here a half hour earlier. I, I, um, so I'm actually flying out to China today. Right after this talk, I'm literally gunning it to the uh, airport to uh, fly out to China. And uh, I figured, you know, hey, it's, I got plenty of time. You know, I got to get there by Sunday or Monday morning. So I book my flights and everything, and, or I go, go to look to book my flights. And the only flights I can get out is either 6 a.m. or 10.30 a.m. So uh, it worked out good that uh, you're all here early for me. I appreciate it. Um, can we get a round of applause for everybody that put B-Sides on for in Cleveland? This is awesome. I mean, this is awesome to see in Cleveland. I mean, we have Johnny Football, we got LeBron now, maybe Kevin Love. I mean, and now we got B-Sets Cleveland. So it's all kind of working together, everybody coming here to Cleveland. This is like the next hot spot. So no, seriously, I mean, Rocky and everybody else that put on this, uh, this uh, endeavor, I mean, it's, it's great and we're happy to sponsor it. So all the beer you're gonna be drinking tonight, um, hopefully came from us. Uh, so if you're drinking the beer, you know, give a little salute to Trusted Sec out there. Uh, just a quick intro, I'm uh, Dave Kennedy, I'm a founder and principal security consultant over at uh, Trusted Sec. I started a few years ago, we're located here in Cleveland. Uh, I used to be the chief security officer over at Diebold, uh, testified in front of Congress. Anybody ever watched the hearing for Congress? Any, yeah, a good couple people, yeah. I got my ass handed to me the second time around, but uh, the first time I thought I did pretty good. Um, and then we, and I've, been on, I've been on Fox News and CNN and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, Jason Street likes to say, I've been on Fox News, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, Fox News, um, a few of the other ones. I tend to go to Fox a little bit more. They, they like me a little bit better, I guess. Um, I, I created the Social Engineer Toolkit, which you're going to see a, a demo of one of my favorite attacks. And it's not the Java Apple one. I've kind of moved. That's still a great attack vector. But one of my other favorite ones uh, that we'll talk about in a little bit is uh, defeating one of the, the most sacred um, parts of what we teach all of our users, which is the hover. So we're going to defeat the hover. You know, we hover over the link, and you look at that, and it's actually going to be malicious. Um, and then I'm gonna, I was the co-author of Metasploit, the Penetration Testers Guide. I was a Marine and a bunch of other stuff. I'm also half the man I used to be. That's me on the left, and that's uh, that's me before I went on to Fox on the right. Um, notice they only get from the waist up, so it's perfect. I can wear whatever I want to. I'm still the sexiest man alive today. Still, oh, where'd that come from? That is not Photoshop, by the way. Um, if you haven't seen that, I was on the, the Katie Kirk show, and um, they were having uh, this guy named Cumberpatch. He's uh, one of the lead actors in a TV show called uh, uh, Sherlock. And it said, up next, one of the world's sexiest men alive. But then they removed the up next and kind of left that there for a couple seconds. So of course, everybody on Twitter was going ape shit when they saw that on there. So, um, But I'm going to keep it and take it, because I like that. I just It was for me. This is a recent trip to Paris that is not Photoshopped. Um, that's legit. I don't do unicorns, I do go to corns. So. so today's agenda, um, this is one of my favorite talks. And this, I've only given this talk probably two times or so. And I, I really like this one because you know, fundamentally in our, in our programs that we teach everybody today, whether we're on the offensive side or the defensive side, you, know, you look at all the investments that we've made in security. I mean, everything from next generation firewalls to intrusion prevention systems, application whitelisting, you name it, we have millions and millions of dollars invested in protecting our infrastructure when we have this whole other avenue of exploitation, which is the users. And this is nothing new. I mean, we've been talking about teaching our users how to defend against things for five years now, right? Six years? I mean, even before that, with, with Mitnick in the 90s and things like that. So this is nothing new. But the fun part is, is you can really do whatever you want to in this. And you know, I, I used to be in like the zero day development side of the house and, and building exploits and all that good stuff. And in order for me to write a good exploit, you know, it take me, you know, a week to, to three months now, depending on, on the type of protection mechanism. If I'm going for a Microsoft bug, I got to get past ASLR and DEP and everything else that's out there. When on the human side, I just have to come up with something creative, something that you would believe to get around your systems. And so today is really going to be talking about what we're taught today, what we teach our end users for education awareness, like literally we teach them this and it's, it's pretty much cookie cutter for every company. We might have some different modifications, but for the most part, whether you're an immature education awareness com uh, organization or you have a very mature program on teaching your users, this, is, this talk is designed how to get around everything that we teach our users and gain access and you know, compromise them in, a, in a, an effective manner. Okay, And this is why it's so much fun because you have so many different um, ways of getting into an organization. So let's talk about how we hack today. This is how you know, we typically hack as, as our, our traditional pen testers or hackers or things like that, and some of the fun ways to get off. So, you know, really it's going to be talking about walk through what we're taught, walk through what really works, and then uh, jack some stuff up. That's a true story, by the way, Chuck Norris. So today, you know, typically we send maybe a few hundreds of emails. You know, uh, we're, we're targeting a large pop uh, population of users. 
Uh, we're trying to get you know shells or you know grab credentials or whatever it ends up being, right? So we you know we we get a list of people or we do open source intelligence and we look for people and we get this list of emails and we send out a mass amount of emails trying to get shells going on, right? And then from there, you know, the company typically tries to test their education awareness program. They try to test how effective their education awareness program is by how many shells we get or how many people click through or all that good stuff. And we also might have, you know, a company that we engage with that sends emails out and then from there, you know, does additional education awareness, all that good stuff, right? Sometimes, you know, um, has anybody been in a company where they, the, the first social engineer they ever did was a highly political one where like pissed off like half the company? Oh yeah, we've all been there, right? So when you do that, right, it's a very emotional time because people feel like they've been coaxed or conned and they feel like the security people are the reason for that. So there's a lot of things to think about when you do that. So a lot of people go to like misspellings, you know, like, like the Nigerian print scam, which I still try to, I haven't got my money back from that yet. I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, you know, grab percentage of metrics, you know, train people on, on who click things. And that's kind of the mentality that we're at now, right? So send emails, you might have like a fish me or something like that. You know, they click the email, then they go through some sort of, you know, online training that says, hey, you should, probably shouldn't click, this is what you should look for, all that good stuff. Sound about right? Okay, cool. And by the way, you might have like an online CBT or something like that, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now what I like doing is a little bit different. I like targeting only a couple of people. So like I'll go for, you know, folks like sales folks are my favorite because they will literally do anything you want them to. You can be like, hey, open this email and download this piece of malicious software which is going to hack your computer and steal all your passwords. And you're like, well, cool, but do I still get the sale? <laughs> you know, and so you can do whatever you want to to sales people. Like you can be like, listen, I want you to open up your, your antivirus, disable it first before you download this piece of email. And they'll be like, well, how do I disable the antivirus? Well, you're we're like, well, just right click and hit stop. Well, it's not letting me. Okay, well, can, can you open up a command prompt? And then sure, no problem. Am I still going to get the sale? So, you know, you target people that you know you're going to get a, a lot of, uh, of, 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 of less resistance from. You know, like targeting IT folks is fine because you obviously get things like elevated permissions and stuff like that. But at the same time, you've got to look at what you're trying to attack. You're trying to go after the company. You want that foothold in, right? So I'm going to go after a couple of people that I know are going to click on my emails that I know are going to be believable. And I'll create something that is believable to them. You know, whether it's, it's something that's like a benefit thing. Like my favorite one that I've talked about a couple of times is, is targeting health benefits because no one knows what the hell's going on with health benefits right now and the new affordable health care laws and the new legislatures coming in. So you can do whatever you want to in the healthcare space and no one's going to notice the difference. So they're going to click on anything you possibly can. Like, hey, based on the new Affordable Health Care Act, there's a new, you know, law that requires you to sign off on this new policy and blah, blah, blah. They go to it, they enter the credentials in and you got that and then you compromise the machine just to, just to kind of rub it in them. And then from there, you know, you have access to everything. So, you know, target only a couple of people. And does anybody know why targeting a couple of people is important? They don't tell their friends. They don't, they're gonna, well, they're not, they're, you're not going to hear a lot of people talking about it inside the organization, right? You, you have a less of a, a chance of getting detected versus sending it to 100 people. So if I target one or two people, the chances of me getting caught are significantly less than if I send it to 100 people. So I'm going to go after a couple people. I'm just going to sit there and wait. Be patient. I mean, if I did send it out to 100 shell, if I send 100 emails out, I'd probably get a shell almost instantaneously, right? I'd already compromised them almost instantaneously. But my window of time between the time I have to compromise them to when I have to migrate off to different shells and hopefully evade their, their incident response when they know something's happening is a very small window. So targeting a couple of people, two or three maybe max, and sitting there and just waiting. Go grab a beer or something and come back and you should have a shell by then. If not, send it to one or two more people and wait. Chances of you getting detected are much less. And so, you know, that, 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 has, that has a high success rate. If you look at the, the SE training, um, this one bothers me, all right? <laughs> it's my favorite picture of all time right there. Uh, this one bothers me because literally we're like, hey, user, you need to take an hour out of your day to go through this next, 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 next online CBT. I mean, when I was in charge of a security program, you know, at Diebold, you know, the, the, the education awareness thing that we had there, it changed since then, but I mean, the education awareness thing was, it was an hour, you know, pre presentation. As a CSO of a company, you know what I did to that online CBT? I was like, next, 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 finish. And I'm in charge of security. There's no way I'm gonna spend an hour going through this. So we have these online CBTs that are supposed to train our users. They're boring as hell. They, they don't relate to the people. They're not funny, they're not interactive. They don't, you know, trigger our brains though that we should. And so maybe you have a one day training session, maybe not. Maybe you use a third party to fish you, maybe you don't. You know, when I go after it, you know, you have to be able to understand when you actually do real world scenarios. For one, does anybody know the two critical parts of education awareness? The first one is the technology. Do you have enough stuff on your endpoints to protect against an attack? And if that fails, do you have the ability for the users to at least be able to report it to the security team? Those are the two components that make a successful program. 
And so when I target an organization, you have to be able to understand that, listen, we have a pretty good amount of technical controls, and we'll talk about those in a little bit, but you also have to focus on how users relate. Like, you know, the target breach was perfect because it hit everybody, right? So sending out emails to your, your population, giving them ideas of what's happening with Target, how they can fix it, what they should do, you know, all those things. Heartbleed, another example. The things that, that relate to people. If there's a big breach that doesn't relate to your company, but relates to them personally, that's great. Especially if you can start to relate to them in their own lives. Like, for example, uh, targeting people like, um, you know, how to secure your home wireless or how to protect your kids on Facebook. Those are things that relate to people and then in turn relate back to your corporation and its security. So there's a lot of things you can do in real world side to do it. Now, what's, what's favorite, my favorite is uh, people still do USB drops. I don't understand it. Like, we disabled auto on like 10 years ago. And so now we're still supposed to like drop USBs in the parking lots and, and you know, stalls and stuff like that. It doesn't make any sense. What's, you know, so auto is disabled. You know, you, now you're going to require the user to like hopefully double click on an EXE or something like that. I mean, hopefully we're at a little bit better stance than that. Probably not, but hopefully a little bit. My favorite is the postal system. The postal system is like better, is my number one period preferred way of doing whatever you want. Like you can be anybody you want to in the postal system, which I don't know if that's legal or not, but anyways, um, you can be anybody you want to in the postal system and tell them to do things. Like you can be like, hey listen, you know, I'm so and so from corporate security on this nice little letterhead, it's from your address that, that comes from the corporation and everything, you send it to somebody. You have instructions on how to compromise their machine in that, in that, in that little thing that they open. This is much better than doing like web phishing or sending email phishes. The postal service is phenomenal. I love sending out, uh, we did one recently where uh, we sent it to uh, a corporate headquarters and uh, so we had this, you know, we had the nice letterhead on there and everything and literally, you know, the script that we run disabled all their security mechanisms and then dropped the shell onto the box and gave it back to us and they did it all for us. Like, you can do whatever you want to. You can be anybody you want to when you're doing things for the postal service. I love these. These are my, one of my favorite ones out there. Um, in person, so, so what's funny about uh, uh, in-person social engineering today is we try to be like, uh, in the security industry, we try to be like the, the Mission Impossible guys. We're computer nerds, right? And we're trying to like hop over fences and lockpick doors and break into buildings and vaults and everything. That is not real world. Like, hey, we might, you know, we might piggyback somebody. Has anybody heard of the Proxmark? A couple people? Proxmark is you can order it online for like, probably I think it's like 400 bucks or something like that. And literally it gives you the ability to clone somebody's badge. So you walk past them, but you literally have to touch them. Right? It works for me because I already hugged everybody here, so I already have all your badges if you have one. But I mean, for normal people, if you walk up with somebody that's walking out of a company, like, hey man, come here. <laughs> that's so right, so right. You know, and you're cloning their badge at the same time. It doesn't work. So you know, you literally have to get up to somebody so close to pro to, 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 to get, you, you almost physically have to touch it. I mean, about that part to get the proxmark to work. Is that real world? Is anybody really going to spend the time to penetrate your organization with the proxmark? I, well, I would, but that's, yeah. So real world, make it simple. We, we go overboard on stuff. It's like, hey, we're going to hop over fences. We're going to shimmy a you know, window open, and we're going to hop through the window. And you know, I'm going to, look at this, I can hardly cart my, myself over a fence anymore, let alone you know, like getting into these things. Why even bother? Because no one's going to do it. My favorite is, is literally, you know, a, a prime example, I was doing a major retail chain recently, okay? And the whole purpose was, was for us to test their, uh, their uh, physical security at the store locations. And so they have all these stores and everything. And um, they're like, well, hey, what are you going to do? Are you going like, to like impersonate somebody? Are you going to spoof your phone number? Are you going to do this? Are you going to come in as a, you know, a, a consultant that's going to you know, fix all these things? And so I'm like, I, I don't know. I'm going to take a look at it. Maybe I need to do that, but let me just take a look. So I walk into the store, okay, dressed like this, right? Like, decent, I guess, you know, presentable. I walk into the store, just like this. I go to the, the cash register in the point of sale systems. I go over there and unscrew something. Walk out with the point of sale system in the cash register. <laughs> Put it in my car, shut the door, and drive off. And then I'm like, oh shit, this has cash in it. And I'm like, I, so I'm calling the customer, like, what should I do? I, I got a whole bunch of cash. I got like $10,000 in cash right now. I started freaking out myself because it's too successful. So I mean, I was just like, I mean, it would be one big part. That's, hey, by the way, where do you think the sponsorship money came for B sides, all right? So, <laughs> thank you, customer, for reading. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I mean, we don't have to do that crazy stuff. Literally, we overthink a lot of this stuff. You walk into a store, you walk into a, a uh, um, like one, one of the ones that I always like doing is, uh, and this is going to sound horrible because I'm profiling somebody, um, but I sit in a car and I dress up in a suit, okay? And I sit there and I wait for the person that has the most beater car in the morning pop up. And, and it has nothing to do with that person. It's just typically they're going to be staff-oriented people, correct? It's not the guy that's driving a Ferrari into the thing that might actually challenge you. 
So you walk in behind this person, you have a cell phone on, and they're not going to challenge you because you look important. You walk through and you're just like, yeah, yeah, blah, 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 piggyback in, okay, yeah, and then you're in the building. You don't have anything else to worry about. And you also have to be careful on certain scenarios. Like uh, one time we were doing a, uh, a physical for a company, and so we get into this company, and uh, we go up to, we, we, we piggyback in, we to, and our goal was to get to the data center and do some stuff there. So we get up to this conference room, and we're sitting in this conference room, and I'm like, well, hey, why don't we just call from the conference room to the data center and say, hey, I'm so-and-so from, from security, why don't you let these guys in so they can, you know, blah, 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 do whatever. So I call from the conference room, and I'm like, hey, I'm so-and-so, um, you know, can you let us down into the, the uh, can you let these guys down to the data center, we're doing an audit, blah, 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 can you let them in? He's like, who'd you, who'd you say you were? I'm like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm Joe. He's like, I'm really good friends with Joe, and I have no idea who you are. I'm like, quick, we were, you know, we're running out. <laughs> Trying to get out of there as quick as possible, right? Um, so you got to be careful on certain ones that you do. But most of the cases, it's got to be simple, easy. I mean, the, the, the stuff is so simple. I mean, the huge store chain that we uh, did the same thing for, I mean, literally, to get to the server room in those stores, what did I do? <laughs> okay, I'm in. You know, it's like, you don't have to do anything different as long as you look like you apply. You don't need to be nervous, all that other good stuff. So here's what we teach our users. And this is, this is important because it's pretty much standard throughout all of the companies that we go to. So first, here's what users are taught. You know, don't provide sensitive information. Does anybody know what sensitive information is to the user? What's, this, what's sensitive information to the user? Is it IP? No. No. Is it anything related to your company? No. So things like um, social security numbers. You don't want to ask somebody for the social security number and point up. Like they will get defensive unless you break away some barriers like HR and stuff like that, and they actually validate who you are. Then you can do something like that. But you know, most cases they don't care about IP. Like I get chemical formulas and things like just by calling people up. Like, hey, dude, I'm in blah blah blah. I got this huge government contract. You know, what, what's what's the chemical formula? Like, oh, E plus seven two. I'm like, sweet, th dude, thanks, appreciate it. You know, all good. Hey, can you upload me the, the latest uh, source code for your new product? Cool, no problem. All good. So, I mean, those are, those are easy ones. But, I mean, when it comes to don't provide sensitive information, the users relate it much differently than people on the other side do. Now, phone spoofing is, is obviously trivial. I mean, you have things like spoof app and, you know, all these different phone apps you can do to um, spoof your phone number originating from somebody. And so a lot of times, you know, when we go and we target companies, we'll spoof our phone number coming from inside the company. Boom, you just eliminated one method of, of confrontation there because it looks like it's coming from inside the organization. Um, a funny one on this is um, we were doing a, a pen test for a uh, uh, um, manufacturing company. And they were celebrating like their, their 50 years of, of being in business inside the United States. I'm like, yeah, that's great. You know, the first thing I did when I, when I went onto their site, and I'm doing open source intelligence and reconnaissance on this company to build my pretext, is I go to their, their website and I go to their, their, their blog or, or about, you know, the news page that kind of has like, you know, streaming things about the company because I like to learn about the company I'm targeting. And I go up in there and, and it's this big promotion. Like they have, like, you know, the whole website skin, 50 year anniversary, you know, and their PR person is, is, you can tell, posts every single one of these blogs, right? And the first blog was, you know, we're so excited about our 50 years of anniversary, blah, 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 blah. This is so great. So what do I do is I send an email to the, the PR person coming from like, you know, worldmedianews.com, which is a domain I register. I'm like, I am so interested in doing a story on your 50 years of, of being in business. Is there any way that we can get you on the phone and talk to you and kind of, you know, understand where your company's going and all that good stuff and why you, you know, focus still predominantly in the United States and all of a sudden I, I wanted to sound, you know, like I was really interested. I was, I mean, I, for, for different reasons, but, you know. So she sends me an email back and, and what does that one email tell me? Just that one email. What's that one email tell me? Don't think technical. No, they're, 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 they're the structure for their email. The structure for their email, right? So now I know the title, right? How they do the titles, the logos and the colors and how they sign things and the phone numbers and all that good stuff, right? It's perfect. That's all I really need. I still call her just to be courteous. I didn't want to be like a, a dick or anything. I'm just so, so I talked to her for a while. I'm like, I'm so excited about this. You know, you guys are a great company, all this good stuff. So then I start um, crafting up an email. I'm like, okay, based on your guys' 50 year anniversary, and I, I had this nice, you know, press release that was in a PDF and everything. The PDF it was not malicious at all. It was a legit PDF, 100% legit. And so, you know, I'm like, hey, you know, uh, based on our, you know, this is coming from, I spoofed it from the, um, the PR person. I sent it out to about 20 people, um, which I broke my rule, by the way. Um, but I sent it out to about 20 people. I'm like, based on, you know, 50 years of being in, in business, we want to send you, um, you know, we're going to give away 50 free iPhones to the first 50 people that register. I only sent it to 20 people. Which is really evil, by the way. And it sounds like, like ridiculous, but people believe that, obviously, because it's part of their 50 year, it's big promotion, right? So, what happened when I send those 20 emails out? Anybody know? Yeah, they call. 
PR it call no, not only the PR person was never notified, which is great, but it caused a complete shitstorm inside the company because people were forwarding off to everybody and everybody's like trying to get iPhones. <laughs> so I had like 70 shells coming back and then 100 shells coming back. I'm like, whoa! I'm like, oh crap! You know? So I, I, I made a mistake though when I was doing this. So I sent it out at like probably one or two o'clock in the afternoon. And so by the time I got all the shells back and everything, they were doing a really good job on user access. So none of the users had administrative uh, level access. And in order for me as an attacker, I need to hook myself into that network so that I can maintain myself in that environment and then from there get access to IP and everything else, right? So what happens around 4.35 o'clock? Everybody goes home, right? So all my shells start dropping like bloop, 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 bloop. I'm like, uh-oh, uh-oh, what am I gonna do? So I'm like, okay, well, let me, let me figure something out here. So I spoofed my phone number coming from the help desk. And I, the reason I had access to the help desk number is because I had access to everybody's OWA because I had all their computers, right? So I get their help desk number and I spoof my phone number coming from the help desk and I call Bob. I'm like, Bob, hey man, this is, this is Joe from the help desk. You know that, you know that, that uh, iPhone giveaway thing? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm so excited about it. I'm like, yeah, it was total, it was total crap. Like it was a scam. Like they're trying, they're, they're, we're getting hit by um, some Chinese hackers and they're trying to break into our, our infrastructure, which is by the way where I'm going in a little bit, so I better not be careful. <laughs> my phone, I'm hopefully my phone's off right now. Um, so, you know, I'm like, so basically, you know, this is a total scam. He's like, damn it. He's like, I knew this company would never give 50 iPhones away. This place sucks. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, dude, it's okay, it's okay. I'm like, I'm, I understand this place does suck, you know. Let's just let's just focus on getting this fixed. I'm like, so if you notice your mouse jiggling around and some other stuff, I'm just trying to fix it. He's like, all right, I'll just sit here and everything, blah blah blah. So then I hang up the phone with Bob and I and I spook my phone over from Bob's number and I call the help desk. I'm like, hey, this is Bob so and so. I'm getting this weird kernel 32 memory exceptions flaw and Windows Office. I, I'm like, I really know how to hit the start menu, bro. Can you come in here and help me help me out? So you know, the help desk remotes into the machine. What happens when they remote into the machine? Boom, right? You got your, you got your Kerberos tokens, you got cash credentials, you got all this other good stuff, right? So then I impersonate the token, get access into the network, and then from there I got a foothold. It's just by telling them they got hacked, right? What was, what was really bad about this one that really jacked me up is, uh, so people started emailing me, like after their, their IT department started doing like incident response and blocking the site, this lady actually emails me and is like, hey, I can't get to the site because our stupid security people are blocking it. Is there any way that you can get around it so I can still get registered for the iPhone? I'm like, yes, yeah, just go to this new site we have here. It's perfect. <laughs> Even worse, like we had this other lady email me and she's like, oh my God, she's like, this is a godsend. She's like, I've been really struggling with money and my daughter has cancer and she's in the hospital and she's gonna love this iPhone. I'm like, so literally I, in the middle of having shells, I went up to Best Buy and bought an iPhone and I sent it out to her. I'm like, I'm not even messing with that one, man, because karma's, karma's a bitch, I mean. <laughs> some, of the, some of the stuff that we're taught, the hover, right? Um, the hover's one of my favorite ones because it gives users a sense of security, right? We tell our users, listen, when you get an email or you go to a website, make sure you hover over that link to make sure it's legit, right? Because if you hover over the link and it says, you know, you know, benefits.trustedsec.com, that is a legit email, or that's a legit domain. Is that, is that correct? Can we teach everybody that? Yeah. Right, the hover, right? What if I told you I'm gonna defeat that here in a couple seconds, right? Great, right? Yeah, that sucks. This one's really evil. I feel really bad about it, actually. A little dirty, but we'll, we'll get to that. So, the Social Engineer Toolkit uh, is one that I started a few years ago, um, and, and this attack vector's in there, it's called the webjacking method. And it's actually been in there for a while, but I rewrote it uh, to be a lot more devastating and believable here, and I'll show you that in a little bit. Has anybody here used set before? Wow, almost everybody, that's great. So just really quick, um, this, this version I released, uh, 6.0.4, was released last week, and uh, since I have a big plane trip, I'm sure you're gonna see a major revision coming up uh, here in the next, you see 6.1 here soon. <laughs> It's probably something like coming home or LeBron, you know, something like, I've been, been a little bit obsessed with that lately. But um, so really, if you look at set, it's, it's, it's the ability to create effective testing in your environment to be able to, to get around a lot of things. Like, like I'm not going to show you the Java Apple attack, which is a good one, but the, the latest version in 6.0 um, improves on the Java Apple attack significantly. For example, um, it does uh, predictive analysis on the box that you're going after. So like, for example, let's just say you're running a Windows 7 machine. It has a high probability of exploitation based on PowerShell and a couple other methods, and it tries each one of those until it gets a successful method. Um, same thing for like Windows XP, it falls back to a bunch of different methods, like Excel, uh, uh, Excel injection, um, you know, then from there it goes to VB injection, and then from there the last thing it does is uh, drop uh, an actual executable, which I don't prefer to do. Uh, but the new version of set, you know, we have these things like next generation firewalls, uh, we have application whitelisting. What's great around that is it gets around all of those because it uses um, encryption the entire process through, and it doesn't actually drop anything on the box itself. So it uses a dynamic cipher key, AES-256 encryption, all the shell codes encrypted real time, gets decrypted in memory, uh, sends it back over an encrypted tunnel, and it's proxy aware, so it'll go over HTTP and HTTPS. 
So you know, what's great about web attack vectors is if I go to a website, I'm already authenticated, right? So I'm just gonna hook that same session and then use that to traverse and then get all my shells out of the network um, over your HTTP and HTTPS communications. So it works out well. And that's the Java applet attack, and that, that works great. And what's funny is um, Java, you know, it's been a cat and mouse game with us for a long time, or Oracle. Um, but they really, and I think it was like Java 7 update 42. Um, I think, what the, what, what's the most recent update? I can never keep up. Yeah, 65. That was like yesterday, it was like on 42, and now it's up to 65. So um, a lot of issues with Java. But, uh, you know, what's, what's interesting is they disallowed what are called self-signed certificates. Um, so you can no longer use those. But it's funny, because to get a code signing service, I mean, you know what you have to do? Yeah, call on the website. Like nothing. You have to pay the money and you get a code signing certificate, right? And you can, what's great is you can, like, doing what's called doing business as. So you can register doing business as as anybody you want to. So, like, I'm, I'm doing business as, like, this applet is secure and verified. Uh, doing business as, this is legit, please click it. Like, hey, this is malware. If you click this, it's going to compromise your computer. It doesn't matter. They're going to click on it anyway. Um, so, you know, you can do in business as whatever and just buy a code signing cert and whatever, you're good to go. Now, one warning is, I mean, set is just a tool. Like, if you just run a tool, it's, you're as good as the tool is and everything else, you need to do proper um, understanding of how you're going to target a company. And so that's why it's really important to focus on things like open source intelligence, reconnaissance. You need to understand who you're targeting, who you're going after, your user population, what are your objectives, you know, building a dossier in the company so that when you go after them, you know the company better than they do. I mean, when I go after somebody, I mean, what's great is like, is anybody here on LinkedIn? Of course we are. Even the security guys, as, as, as crazy as we are in privacy, all of us are on LinkedIn. And all of us list the technologies that we're badass at, right? Like, great, we're awesome at, we just, we just implemented FireEye. Thank you. Appreciate it. You know, you're giving me your entire defensive capabilities on your LinkedIn profile, and now I need to know what I need to circumvent to go after you. I mean, everything from, you know, hey, we're a Microsoft shop, or Oracle, or SQL Server 2005 or 2008, or whatever you put on there, it's great for me as an attacker to enumerate all that. So I can already profile all your defenses prior to me attacking you. And then from there, I understand a little bit more, gain a little bit more information, and I start to get a little bit more understanding of what I'm going to go after. Then from there, I find a couple people that I think are juicy, i.e. sales folks, marketing are great. Um, whatever it ends up being, marketing is actually kind of a, a challenging one because they usually know what's going on as far as like direction of the company. So I usually stay away from marketing a little bit. Um, but I'll target, you know, um, you know sales folks, uh, engineers are great, um, any supportive staff type things, administrative assistants, um, those are all good ones to go after. Um, administra if you're going after executives, administrative assistants for the executives are great, you know, because they click on everything, and then from there they have direct access usually into the email of the executives, all that good stuff. So you need to know what you're doing before you actually use set. So we're going to do a demo here real quick, um, and I'll show you here. Now what's funny is this computer is literally got nothing on it that I care about because I'm going to China. So this is a throwaway laptop. Um, so I got literally only, only got set on here and this is it. I don't even know if I have my password. Yeah, I don't remember it. Hang on. There we go. All right. So set is open source. Obviously it's free. And we broke a, broke a new record. For version six, we actually had 1.4 million downloads, which is really cool to see. All right, so we're going to go to the social engineering attack vector, which is number one. And one of my favorite methods in here, um, aside from what we're going to show you here in a second, is, um, is anybody familiar with PowerShell injection? Yep. So a couple years ago, where's Josh Kelly at? Where's he at? Over there. There he is. So Josh and I presented at a conference called DEF CON. You might, might have heard of it. It's a little, little conference. Um, but we presented, it was like a, man, it was probably like four years ago now, DEF CON 17. And, uh, you know, it was funny because Josh was like, uh, um, hey, I just, I, you know, this new thing called PowerShell is coming out. It's like in beta. He's like, I think we could break it. And, you know, of course, I'm like, yeah, let's, let's figure it out and break it. So we had a talk that we gave um, at, at DEF CON on how to do a lot of cool things. Um, like, for example, even in, in its most restricted sense, you have what are called execution restriction policies. You have uh, unrestricted, restricted, all signed and unsigned, I think, are the four, uh, four, four different uh, policy sets in there. And even in its most restrictive sense, you can bypass all of the execution restriction policies. So regardless of what settings you have on PowerShell, if you have PowerShell installed, period, you have the ability to inject straight up shellcode into memory through PowerShell, which is really damaging because in most cases, I mean, do you, does anybody here have application whitelisting? And this is, I'm not going to make fun of you, do it's cool. So we, a few of us have application whitelisting. Is PowerShell whitelisted? It has to be, right? It has to be because it's a legitimate function that Windows uses for updates, for making modifications to your systems, all that good stuff. So you have, if you, is anybody here still running Windows XP in their environments? Don't, don't, don't come on, like 99% of you need to be raising your hands right now because that's, that's, that's not legit. All right, so everybody's still running Windows XP. You're inherently more secure with Windows XP than you are with Windows 7. 
There's really no difference other than PowerShell. And so if you have PowerShell on your machine, we have the ability to, to get remote code execution right off the bat without having to worry about things. Don't get me wrong, PowerShell is phenomenal, I love it. But it's a great reliable exploitation method. And so in here, the PowerShell attack vectors, you can generate that code automatically, and literally it's a copy and paste. So if you get any type of injection, like through SQL injection or through uh, you know, um, any type of remote code execution, you have the ability just to literally copy and paste a string and you'll get a shell coming back, just put it on memory that nothing's gonna pick up. It's just awesome, uh, at least for us. Um, and then you also have the ability, um, I don't know if you noticed that, but um, so if you're attacking a 64-bit platform, you have to have 64-bit shell code, right? Unless you run yourself in a 32-bit process. So um, a guy named Matthew Graber came out with this PowerShell injection technique uh, a while back and it was phenomenal. It was, it was like the coolest thing that ever happened. The problem with that though is you needed to have either 32-bit shellcode or 64-bit shellcode. And so what I ended up doing is creating what was called the magic unicorn attack. And uh, what it does is it um, automatically detects whether or not the operating system is 64-bit or 32-bit. And then it'll actually downgrade the, uh, the process to 32-bit so you only have to use 32-bit shellcode on the system itself if it's a 32 or 64-bit uh, platform. So a lot more efficient, uh, works really well. And just to show you an example, I'll just do it really fast. So we're gonna use the alphanumeric uh, shellcode injector number one. And let me get my IP address real quick. We'll paste that, and let's do port 443. Now notice here it, it exports it into the PowerShell director here, and I'm just gonna show you what that is real quick. I'll set, I'll set up my listener. And if you use set, everything is stored under the, whatever um, user you are, then dot set. Everything is stored within there. And it automatically creates an RC file so you can listen for Metasploit automatically for you. Um, but literally, this is the command here. See that? That's the command. And that gets around all of your execution restriction policies. And just to show you really quick what that looks like. If I just copy and paste this here real quick. And this is, this, the whole command is just encoded. It's uh, cast Unicode first and it's base64 encoded on top of it. If I just paste this into my, my Windows 8 box, right? If I could paste. Like I said, this is my burner box. So I don't know if, there it is, okay. So as soon as I hit enter, ha, that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> Last update. Tempit wine is not too long. I don't know what they did here. I'm calling shenanigans. Well, anyways, I don't know why it's doing that, but I have a plane ride to figure it out. <laughs> but literally, you get a shell coming back uh, on your on your box and everything, and everything be good to go. So, anyways, that was a total fail. So now I'm going to use the other attack vector, which is the the hover defeat. So we're going to go to website attack vectors number two, and you do the website attack vectors, and then we're going to do web jacking, which is number five. Now this attack was originally made by a guy named uh, Mgen and White Sheep. That they were originally in the backtrack development team. And with version six, I redesigned it because it's such an effective attack. I mean, you can literally create such a believable fantasy for these, these, these end users that it's almost near impossible to detect it. And so I'm gonna show you that right here, and it's number five here, so I'm gonna select number five. And what I also like doing is the multi-attack vector too. So like, I'll use the Java applets, and maybe, I usually don't, the funny thing is like, I, I rarely use exploits anymore. Because when I, when I go after a company, you know, does anybody here in, in an organization have the exact same version of IE deployed across their entire organization? Everybody laughs, right? Because it's like, hell no, there's no way, right? We have IE8 for compatibility, IE9, we're testing IE10 or 11. You know, we have IE6 still. You know, so, you know, there's a whole gambit of things. So you have that. Does everybody have the same version of Adobe consistently across, uh, across their entire environment? We have everybody laughs again, right? Java, even, even more laughable, right? So in order for me to exploit those methods, I have to understand exactly what version they're running, what version I'm gonna attack, and what operating system so I can get around the protection mechanisms. That's very difficult for me to profile unless I start probing a bit to get a sample size and then from there, start selectively targeting. So I don't run exploits a lot of times because it's much more difficult for me to get remote code execution. The Java applet attack is great because it doesn't rely off of any type of exploit. It's how Java's designed to suck. So because Java sucks, we have a reliable exploitation method. We don't, it doesn't matter if you use an update 77,422. It doesn't matter. You can use whatever you want to and it works. So in this case, I'll use the, the web jacking method number five. We'll do a site cloner. And I'll just clone gmail.com, okay? Just as an example, because it has a username and password field on it. But 
And it's going to go to accounts like google.com, okay? So in this case, it's going to want to start Apache. You hit yes. Start Apache, and it's ready to go. Now over here in our var, so notice here there's nothing in our, in our harvester, right? There's nothing in here. We haven't harvested any credentials yet, right? So over here, So normally what I would do, so let's just take an example of like trustedsec.com. And let's say I was targeting a benefits website. And benefits.trustedsec.com was a legitimate website. What I would do here is I'd create a really believable website, right? I'd say like, hey, new, due to new regulations, blah, 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 you need to you know, update your privacy policy. Make sure you hover over, I would, I'll put this in the instructions in, the, in, this, in, this, in this website. Make sure you hover over the link, make sure it's HTTPS, and you're going to benefits.trustedsec.com, okay? So I'd make this look believable, but for demo purposes, you know, obviously I'm not going to do it. So we click here, and what does that say on the bottom? Anybody, can everybody see that? It's a little blurry. What does that say? Someone should shout it out. Accounts.google.com. No trickery there, right? Not JavaScript. Works with no script. Works beautiful with no script. No JavaScript whatsoever in any of these pages here. Zero. So HTTPS colon four forward slash accounts.google.com. Legit. Would you all say it's legit? And you're running no script, guys, so you're, you're safe, right? It, it works for IE, it works for Firefox, works for Chrome, and I have no idea because I don't think anybody uses Opera anymore, so I haven't tested on Opera. Um, but it, it might work on Opera. I don't know. But it definitely works on all versions of IE, all versions of Firefox, all versions of Chrome, Safari. It works great on all of them. And what's great about these type of bugs <clears throat> is they will never be fixed. Like when I have to find it, when I find a zero day, you know, I have to disclose that zero day, and then it's fixed within a couple weeks or a month or whatever, and then I don't have that reliable expectation method. So I just burned a whole month of work on re researching zero days, right? So with these type of bugs, what's great about these is that you can exploit the living heck out of them and it's going to take years and years and years and years and years to fix, if at all. So finding these type of things that are more browser specific compatibility issues are so much better than a zero day. So if I, if I click this, watch what's going to happen. My, my machine, you're going to see a tab open here, right? It's going to be here. And you're going to see my machine is actually going to be at accounts.google.com. I'm going to be there in the URL bar and everything. But then if you notice what happens real quick, pay attention to the URL bar. It's going to do a quick switcheroo. I'm going to be at my malicious site. Now, obviously, in this type of scenario, I wouldn't use an IP address and all that good stuff, so it would look more legit and believable. Uh, but watch. I'm going to click. I'm not going to do any trickery. Click. I'm at accounts.google.com, right? Quick switcheroo. Username. Password. Redirects back to the legitimate site. And here, we, we harvest the username and password. It's pretty messed up, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a little nervous about that one, man. So that was a realistic example, right? And you see how easy that was to build, right? I mean, and, and what's crazy is, see the code for this? There's nothing insane. Look at this. Oh, hang on. There it is. Okay, hang on. There we go. Okay. The code for this is that long. That's it. So, I mean, it's super easy, and it's really easy to do. It doesn't require JavaScript, which is nice. So you obviously customize the HTML code, make sure you have your redirects in there and everything else. So some things to ponder on this. So for the... For the um, uh, for the Java Apple attack, there's a lot of things that we can do to hopefully try to prevent a lot of this. Uh, for example, education weariness can kind of help some of it, but that's really difficult because these types of attacks are very believable. It's not like you're going to be like, hey, every time you click a link, hawk that URL bar until you enter your credentials. Like, you need to watch it as you're typing it out. It's going to work out really well, right? It's not going to work out so well. So other things you can consider. Two-factor authentication. This one's tricky because we've moved to an era where we've, we've made two-factor authentication user error prone. Like, for example, give RSA the amount of crap for all the NSA stuff and everything else, but their key fobs, the physical key fobs they had, took user error out of it. Like, they physically had to have it on them, look at that, and type it in, right? The new stuff, like phone factor is being a, a big one. Phone factor, for me, is, is great as an attacker. What happens when you log in? So if I harvest the username and password, what happens? What happens when I enter my username and password? What happens right after that? The user either A, gets a phone call, right? Or B, gets a text message, right? What happens when you get the phone call? It says, hey, this is blah, 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 corporate. You know, just, just verifying that you're logging in through your, hit one, to yes, that you're logging in. Hit two, no. 
What are they going to do every single time? I must be logging in through my phone or something. One, right? The past seven pen tests I've been on that use phone factor or something like that, I literally log in. I'm like, oh, the first time it happened. I'm like, oh, it got two factor. And I'm like, oh, shoot. I'm about, I was about to close my browser and all of a sudden it logged me in. I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, and I sit there, I'm like, did I do something cool? I mean, it was like, like a zero day or something or what? Is this? No, the user clicked yes. And then I started realizing, like, so we ran into phone factor again. And, and I, I wait. I'm like, I'm going to wait. Logs me in. I'm like, this is great. Third time. Using a password, go grab a beer. Come back, I'm logged in, it's great. It's like beautiful. So whenever we have the ability to make the user error, they will because they don't understand that technology. It's like they, they understand the purpose of it. So you're gonna give them the ability to click a link inside their, inside their text message or hit approve or hit yes or whatever. That puts the error back onto the human. Bad implementation of two-factor authentication. Obviously things like up-to-date software. I mean, <clears throat> listen, if you still have MS Oida 6.7 in your environment, please just go hire like a college kid because that's about the value you're getting from a pen test. Right? We don't even go with us or people that are skilled for hacking. This is a waste of our time. Like literally, what's fun is like when I go to, to do a pen test and they have MSO 67. Like the first day I break in, and like the rest of the week I'm coding set. Like I'm, I'm still on the site, you know, I'm like looking like I'm co doing cool stuff, but I'm because I've already broken everything. It's like just at least update your software, and make it a challenge for hackers. That's that's the simple stuff. Anybody ever heard of uncategorized or unclassified sites? Those are phenomenal. All right, if you have content filtering software like uh, like a blue coat or a scan safe or something, they have this ability inside there called uncategorized or, un or uh, unclassified. And what that does is any sites that aren't registered through their 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 um, through their uh, classification process get denied. Ninety nine percent of the websites that come in for phishing are uncategorized or unclassified. We're we're lazy as hackers. Now don't get me wrong. Whenever we do ours, obviously we submit them to the the blue coat. Like, what, what's funny is um, I'm not going to say which one. Um, I won't say which one. But when I do a, uh, a fish, like you can actually clone their own website for the content filtering software and they classify you as a content filtering website. It's the weirdest thing. So obviously it's not like a foolproof security because it's literally like horrible, but, but most of the hackers don't take that steps to submit it to all of the different uh, companies out there to, to get classified. So you literally stop like 80, 90% of the malware out there. Um, obviously things like no administrator, uh, no administrator stuff. Altillery is a free tool um, that I released. It's more like an active honey pie. It's open source. It works on Windows and Linux and all that good stuff. Early warning indicators. Has so anybody here not heard of the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit or Emmet? If you haven't, check that damn thing out. That is, that is gonna, that is gonna revolutionize your security when it comes to it, and I'll talk about this in a second. Emmet is free. It's from Microsoft, and it stops zero days. And I'll talk about how it does that, and don't get me wrong, there's bypass techniques out for it, plenty of them. Um, but what happens, you know, as an exploit researcher, right, when I'm going through, there's certain mechanisms that I have to get around Windows. So I have to get around address space uh, randomization or ASLR, data execution prevention or death. You know, all these different protection mechanisms that Windows has put in. And in order to do that, the way that I do that is, is typically like return-oriented programming or what we call ROP gadgets, where we actually circumvent a lot of the technology inside of Windows. So in order for me to do that, I have to like basically put, build a puzzle inside memory. I have to grab a couple pieces here, grab a couple pieces here, return, grab a couple pieces here, return some more. Those are all predefined patterns that exploit researchers use all the time. What Emmet does is it allows you to protect against it. It actually looks for return-oriented programming attacks, like exploit, exploit dev stuff. So a lot of the zero-day stuff that comes out, it stops. Like a lot of them. Like all of the exploits that are inside Metasploit right now are stopped by Emmet, except for Java sandbox escapes. When you're talking about sandbox escapes, those are just, just really horrible programming that breaks out of their sandboxes, not traditional exploits. It won't stop those, but it stops buffer overflows, things like that. Um, a lot of good stuff. And it's like super, super hard to install, though. I don't know if you can't see this because it's a little bit blacked out, but literally you have to double click an MSI and hit next, 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 finish, and then you're done. And it's really difficult. Um, but, no sarcasm. Um, now you can't bypass it, okay? Um, there are ways, like Jared DeMott from Bromium uh, did some research and found out ways of basically getting around uh, MS protection mechanisms, all six of the main ones. Uh, Sickness just re recently released one, which is pretty cool, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, um, of getting around and just disarming Emmet completely. But those are extra steps that I have to build in as an expert researcher. And again, I'm already trying to profile your organization, understand what versions and everything else. To build a uh, Emmet bypass net is a lot more time and effort. Here's a recent zero day that came out. Uh, it was the, well, the first IE zero day that looked for Emmet. It's hard to, it's hard to read there. Uh, but what happened was um, it actually checked for Emmet, and if it found Emmet, it just killed itself and didn't run the exploit. Pretty cool, right? And so here's something uh, that Cygnus did. Um, really, it was, it was actually kind of, kind of brilliant. 
Um, what do you do is you just enumerate the base address for uh, the emmet.dll, which is what gets loaded and adds the protection mechanisms inside of that process that you're trying to protect, whether it's IE, Adobe, Java. And you just zero out the, um, the, um, the indexing for, uh, for the emmet.dll. And then all of a sudden now it, whew, I'm awake. <laughs> whew. So it, 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 um, it removed a lot, it removes those protections. Good news is that, that specific method is fixed in Emmet 5, uh, which is the tech preview release. Um, Emmet 5, I think, is slated for later this year um, around the October time frame, which fixes a lot of the, the bypass techniques for Emmet uh, 4.1, which is the current version that's out right now. So Emmet 4.1 update 1 is the latest one that's out right now. Emmet 5 should be out soon. So you, know, you want to make sure they keep up to date with the different versions of Emmet. But this is a big strategy for Microsoft. So talking about fixing stuff. You know, I talked a lot about the different types of attacks that are out there and, and how we talk about education awareness and what we do as attackers and what we teach our users for education. The problem is, is that our education awareness programs are literally built on the programs that we had when Beverly Hills 90210 and you know, Saved by the Bell was out. Like we haven't changed our tactics at all. And it's, it's interesting because we've, we've really changed our tactics when it comes to protecting organizations, whether it's next-gen firewalls or everything else. We've done all of those. But we haven't changed how we teach our users. It has to be fun and interesting and exciting. For me, one of the most important parts of a program is focusing on education awareness. If I, if I had to pick two to, to invest in inside of a, a company, it would be monitoring detection and it would be education awareness. Those are the two programs that I would focus on solely in my organization because those are your highest probabilities of either A, detecting the attack, or B, one of the highest likelihood parts of my, my environment of being compromised. I mean, our users are always going to get infected. So investing in education awareness is, is a key. Having people dedicated to it. I mean, I'd focus on that versus anything else. Because that's going to have the most impact and return that you have in your organization. And by the way, <clears throat> when you have a successful awareness program, you know what happens? People understand security. So when you implement something new, they're not like, oh, it's just those, those guys over at security being all draconian and crazy. It's like, oh, hey, they're really trying to protect and help us. That makes sense. Okay, I'm going to be cool with them doing it. I'm not going to bitch and moan when I implement two-factor authentication. It works out well. Uh, next, you know, building on a program. You know, Bruce Schneider has a disagreement with me here. Bruce Snyder thinks that, you know, um, education awareness should be through attrition, which I disagree with. I mean, you know, having come from a company that had a great education awareness program, I would say that, you know, I don't agree with this at all. You know, you really have to focus on building a program. Uh, first, first is having, step one for, for building it is uh, sell security to your executives first. Obviously having buy-off from your entire company, perfect. And then from there, we start rolling it out and you get a little bit better. Um, building a program, looking at uh, newsletters, things that impact them, like what's happening in their personal lives, Facebook security, all that stuff. Quarterly newsletters, working with like videos or podcasts are great, um, but make it funny and entertaining and exciting because people aren't going to come and listen to it unless it is. Then test the program. Um, you know, looking at um, you know how effective your technical controls are. Can they det uh, stop a lot of the attacks that we're seeing in the wild today? And if not, what do we need to do to um, uh, increase that a bit? And then step four, last but not least, um, is maintaining. So again, continual testing. Um, understand where your weaknesses are. Try to uh, continue to build, um, you know, education, things like that. Um, you know, really try to get users to understand why you're doing things. Like, why are we doing 10 character passwords? Okay, I understand why now because we're trying to protect our company. You know, those are all uh, things that we can really do to maintain that program and keep it going forward. Huh? Anybody have any questions? Brains hurt? <laughs> all right, thanks very much for having me, B-Sides. I appreciate it.